so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's February 2019 and a group of six friends are enjoying a Saturday night out at a house party on Porky Island in Beaufort, South Carolina. It's the kind of place only the locals know about, a quiet waterfront neighbourhood with a private boat dock for residents. Despite being underage, they've been drinking. And as they say their goodbyes about 1am and make their way back to the boat Paul has borrowed from his family, his friends try to convince him to hand over the steering wheel. It's a bumpy ride, according to later depositions. The group described Paul driving in circles, speeding and leaving the wheel unattended. They're scared and they start arguing with Paul. One of them even asks to be let off at a nearby dock, but that doesn't happen. At about 2.20am, the boat crashes into the Arches Creek Bridge and 19-year-old Mallory Bridge and her boyfriend, Anthony Cook, are thrown overboard. Only he resurfaces. As police arrive and a search gets underway, Anthony tells the deputies what they're dealing with. Despite returning a blood alcohol reading three times the legal limit, and despite Anthony indicating Paul as the driver, he is not arrested that night. Even as Mallory's body is recovered downstream eight days later, it's not until two months on that Paul Murdoch is finally charged with three felony counts of boating under the influence, including causing the death of Mallory Beach and seriously injuring two other passengers. But this is only the start of the unravelling of the Murdoch family dynasty. By 2023, there will be five deaths linked to the famous family, including that of Paul himself. Over the course of four years, the truth starts to seep out. And at the centre of the story is one man, Alex Murdoch, Paul's dad. A prominent personal injury lawyer from one of South Carolina's most powerful legal families. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. The Murdochs were one of South Carolina's most prominent legal families for nearly a century. Men in the family, going back generations, traditionally worked in high-profile roles, including lead prosecutors, solicitors and district attorneys, which afforded a level of power to them. They were so influential in the area, locals nicknamed the patch of South Carolina they practised in Murdoch Country. When we pick up this story in 2019, the patriarch of the family is Randolph Murdoch III. He has four children, but we're going to hone in on just one of them, Richard Alexander Murdoch better known as Alex. He's the fourth generation of the Murdoch name, but unlike his father, grandfather and great-grandfather, he wasn't a prosecutor. His specialty was in personal injury law, but his dad did take him on as a volunteer prosecutor. He and his wife Maggie have two sons, Richard Alexander Jr., or Buster, and their youngest son, Paul. They're incredibly rich, primarily in assets, Their main residence is a 1,700-acre estate on the river in Islington. They co-own an island in Buford County, another home in Hampton, a beach house and a couple of properties in Berkeley County. The story we're about to tell is complicated. You're about to hear about the deaths of five people in South Carolina with ties to the Murdoch family. Their cause of death ranges from drowning to gunshots to a fall to the head. It starts with the death of 19-year-old Mallory, as you've just heard. But two years later, Paul and his mum Maggie die in a double homicide. As their deaths are being investigated, police also turn their attention to two historic deaths, the 2015 hit-and-run of Stephen Smith 
and the 2018 trip and fall of Murdoch housekeeper Gloria Satterfield. To help us unravel these deaths and the Murdoch family involvement is Michael DeWitt, an award-winning journalist and author who has been following this story very closely. He joins us now. Michael, firstly, can you tell us about the area where this story is set in South Carolina and its history more broadly? We're in the South Carolina Low Country, which is basically the southernmost part of South Carolina, close to the coast, close to the Atlantic Ocean. So you've got a lot of that scenic Spanish moss kind of vibe, like when you watch Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. You kind of get that scenic moss-colored Southern Gothic vibe along the coast, and then Inland, it's more rural. It's farms and hunting lands and, for the most part, a quiet, out-of-the-way place, part of South Carolina. Can you place the Murdoch family in all of this for us? What was their influence and power in South Carolina over the past few decades? As any state or province, we're divided into legal districts and This area is called the 14th Judicial Circuit. The 14th Circuit is basically five counties here in the Low Country, and the solicitor or the lead prosecutor is elected every four years to basically prosecute all the criminal cases in this circuit, in the 14th Circuit. And that includes Hampton County, Colleton County, Beaufort County, and a couple more. Since 1920, I believe it was, A man named Randolph Murdoch has been elected solicitor of this five-county legal district. Alex's great-grandfather started the family law firm in 1910 and was elected solicitor in 1920. And then his son became solicitor. His grandson became solicitor. So basically, three generations of Randolph Murdochs, and the third and last Randolph to hold the office of solicitor was Alex's father. So it sounds like they were a kind of a family of authority in the area. Is it safe to say that everyone that lived there knew the Murdochs? Yes, everyone in the 14th Circuit in in this area knew the Murdochs. Not only were they in charge of prosecuting all the criminal cases, they had very close connections to law enforcement. Buddy-buddy is a term that's used here. Very closely connected to law enforcement, Department of Natural Resources officers, anybody that's involved in criminal courts in any way, they had some form of control or connection. And on the civil side of the law, they operated this powerful personal injury law firm. So they were also very active in the personal injury business on the civil side. So whether you were suing someone in court for an accident or whether you were on trial for murder, you would have some contact with the Murdochs and They were just truly well-connected on both sides of the courtroom. It sounds like they kind of were the law in that area because they were prosecuting the cases, but they were also there picking up the people who had issues with the prosecution and what happened in the cases. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a very complicated relationship. One thing I've tried to do in my most recent book is I've tried to set the narrative straight. This wasn't some Southern mafia, Dixie mafia family that was taking people out and throwing bodies in the ditches. These people got where they are by, you know, their connections, Southern charm. They had power, but they could walk up to you and shake your hand and say, hey, how you doing? And you would want to vote for them. They just were very, they all had charisma. They all had Southern charm and they'd invite you to a, what we call a pig picking. They'd invite you to a, and I'm, you don't know what you call it in Australia, but you know, you barbecue a hog and you invite your friends and neighbors and they'd have the local law enforcement there. They'd have the town mayor, you know, whoever. And they'd walk up to you, shake your hand and say, hey, how about have a bourbon drink with me? And before you know it, you were kind of liking these guys. And if you ever sat on a jury to determine guilt or innocence, if you come time to vote, you just had a, For the most part, most people liked the Murdochs. They were well-respected and controversial at the same time, some generations more than others. Alex's father, for example, Randolph Murdoch III, not quite so controversial. Alex's grandfather was deeply 
implicated in a lot of scandals, and he always managed to come away clean because of his power and connections. What about Alex? What was his job in the family, and was he a respected part of the community and family? He was. I'm going to use the word complicated a lot. You can be respected and be scandalous at the same time. I mean, you know, you can hear rumors and murmurs that, you know, the Murdochs are a little shady or a little this or a little that. And at the same time, you know, very well respected. Alex worked as a lawyer in the family law firm. His great grandfather started in 1910 and he was a personal injury lawyer there and he served under his father as a deputy solicitor and then served with his father. They were both deputy solicitors under the current guy, Duffy Stone. So as far as the family dynasty, he wasn't a major, he was never the leader, the patriarch, but he was certainly well involved in the family law firm and the solicitor's office. So Alex and his wife had two children. And I want to take us to February 24, 2019, because Paul, one of his sons and his son's friends, they were involved in a boat crash that led to the death of a 19-year-old girl called Mallory Beach. Can you take us back to the moment of impact? So it happened just after, you know, 2 a.m. The police are called. What happened next? It was chaos. This had been a well-documented boat crash, well-investigated. By now, everybody in this area knows almost every detail of that boat crash. But three of the occupants went into the water. There were six people in the boat in all, three couples, three young couples. And three of the people kind of impacted the boat and had injuries, like one, a young man named Connor Cook, got a broken jaw. One of the young ladies cut her arm or her hand pretty bad. There's blood. But three of the young people were ejected when it crashed into this bridge piling right at the, at the foot of this bridge. And two of them swam to safety. And Mallory was the one who, as we now know, struck her head and went in and was lost in the water. Her body was taken by the currents. She was missing for right at seven, eight days before she was found. And about five miles away. So Paul was the one charged with driving the boat. Did that happen straight away? Because there was a bit of controversy about when he was arrested, when he was charged. Absolutely. They were legal games and a cover-up from the start. Paul's father, Alex, and his grandfather, Randolph III, showed up at the hospital that night. And from the moment they arrived on the scene, it was all about protecting Paul. Now, there was controversy, and I can go back and walk you through it as far as who is driving the boat and what happened right before the crash. But time these two lawyers walked into that hospital, it was all about protecting Paul. They were telling all the other young people, don't talk, don't say anything. They're already building a legal defense, you know. If they could suggest, they don't even have to prove, they could suggest that Connor Cook was driving that boat and not Paul, they could create a reasonable doubt. And law enforcement was investigating, but they were dealing with a very powerful family. And you didn't see criminal charges right away. I don't have the exact dates in front of me, but I wrote in our Hampton County newspaper, something like it had been 45 days and still no one has been charged or accepted responsibility for Mallory Beach's death. Law enforcement couldn't even interview him for the first 30 days because they contacted the family and they said, well, you know, we have legal representation now. And so we'll try to set an appointment for you to interview this young man. I've never in my life seen where law enforcement has to make an appointment to interview a suspect in in a fatal accident. But that's what happened here. It took a few weeks for law enforcement to interview Connor and Murdoch and eventually Uh, I want to say maybe April. The accident happened in late February. And in April, Paul Murdoch was arraigned and charged with uh, two felony counts of voting under the influence, resulting in death. Do you think it was community anger and pressure that even led to that happening? It certainly helped. I don't want to speculate and say that if there was no pressure that this would have been swept under the rug. This was a very tragic death. When I told you about the 14th Circuit 
most of the inland counties are very small, very poor, very rural. Beaufort County is the most populated area around here. You've got world-class resorts on Hilton Head Island. You've got a fairly sized town here. A lot of people, daily newspapers, and a young lady lost for a week is going to get attention. But I think the media spotlight and the community outrage help push it to make sure that, hey, somebody's got to be charged for this. This is not going to go away. Somebody has to be charged. And eventually Paul Murdoch was charged. Let's jump forward a few years to June 7, 2021. Paul and his mother, Margaret Murdoch, are found dead in the family home. Can you talk us through that discovery and what happened to them? So picture this. Young Paul Murdoch has been charged. His lawyers are doing their best to drag this thing out. It's been two years. And keep in mind, this was the era of COVID. So a lot of criminal proceedings were being delayed or postponed during that era. So it's been two years and they've managed to drag this thing out. Paul has been arraigned and indicted and charged with her death, but has not gone to court, has not gone to trial for this thing. And obviously the community and the local media We're still wondering, what's going to happen? Is anybody ever going to be brought to justice? And now the world discovers on the morning of June 8th that this young man who was responsible for this young lady's death has been murdered. They were found at the family kennels on the ground near the family kennels. And instantly, when people hear the news, before all the details come to light, The first thing that most people think is, okay, this is backwoods justice. This is a vigilante killing. This is someone connected to the boat crash that said, hey, if the justice system is not going to do its job, we're going to do it. And there were a lot of people who said this is karma. This was deserved. And lots of talk, lots of room, lots of emotions. And then we learn details. We learn that Alex Murdoch was the one who claimed to have found the bodies and called 911. And now we have another investigation going on. And this one was even more hush-hush than the boat crash investigation. With the boat crash, you had investigators slowly and gradually being pressured to release information. They released video footage from the dock before the boat launched. You know, it was a trickle. It was a trickle of information, but they they released documents. They released videos, and it slowly came out to where we knew almost every detail of that night. With this murder investigation, state police took control, and we call them SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Well, state police took control, and it was a hush-hush investigation for months, like very few details. They eventually released a 911 call. But it was another case of, okay, we've got a very powerful, well-connected family. We're not going to just throw this information out there, either maybe to protect the investigation or protect themselves. You can argue either way. When you say hush-hush, were you not getting potential suspects or how the two died or any evidence? Like All of that was kept under wraps. Well, I'll give you an example. Right after the murders, the local sheriff's office issued a statement saying that there is no threat to the public. There is no danger to the public. And that puzzled a lot of people. How can you tell the the community that there's no danger to the public if you don't know something, if you don't have a suspect in mind, you know, because there's a killer on the loose. How can we be sure that no one else is going to die? You know, does anybody else in the Murdoch family need to be concerned? Anybody in this law firm need to be concerned? Anybody in that community? So that was one puzzling piece of information. And to kind of give you an idea of what I mean by hush hush, one of the local newspapers here, a big daily newspaper in Charleston, actually filed a freedom of information lawsuit demanding information, saying, you know, 911 calls are public record. These things are public record. We didn't even get a basic incident report, not one basic incident report for quite some time. And so a a daily newspaper had to file a lawsuit and say, hey, you've got to tell us something. And eventually these reports and this 911 call was eventually released to the public and to the media. Not long into the investigation, the death of a man called Stephen Smith 
back in 2015 was reopened. Who was Stephen and why was it reopened? What were you guys told about all of that? The unsolved homicide of Stephen Smith is even more complicated than all of this. I mean, we've sat through a murder trial. We had the boat crash details. We don't know who killed Stephen Smith or why. His body was found in 2015, lying in the middle of the road. And there was controversy early on. Was it a hit and run? Was he killed and his body placed there? The most recent opinion from an independent pathologist is that it was a hit and run. The rumors in 2015 were that the Murdochs were involved somehow, and it has not been proven whatsoever. There's no evidence to, to actually support that rumor other than when police were investigating Stephen's death, the Murdoch name popped up over and over again. It's recorded multiple times in statements that People are saying, well, I heard this and I heard that. And they were quite possibly repeating the same rumors that the Murdochs were involved. Well, to kind of sum that up, we now believe it was merely a hit and run, whether it was intentional, whether it was accidental, we don't know. But his death remains unsolved. No one's ever been charged or arrested. There's always that rumored possible connection to the Murdoch family. In what way are they connected? Is he a friend? Do they know him? What is the connection? Alex's oldest son, Buster, was a classmate of Stephen. There's rumors that they were friends, but they were certainly classmates. And the Murdoch connection, in addition to being in police reports back in 2015 of people saying that I heard it was the Murdoch, during the course of investigating the double homicide of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, his mother, State police announced that they were opening a new investigation into Stephen Smith's death based on something they heard or something they found during the murder investigation. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with author and journalist Michael DeWitt about a web of mysterious deaths surrounding the powerful Murdoch family in South Carolina. This story is very timeline-based. It has so much in it. So what I'm going to do now is skip to September. It's 2021 still. And Alex resigns from his job. Firstly, is that a big deal for Murdoch to resign from their job? Don't they run the town? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to look at this whole thing in terms of this whole timeline. You know, we've always known that the Murdochs were a little shady, going back to Alex's grandfather. You know, now we've got this boat crash and there was a senator, a Kennedy, was involved in a car crash back in the 60s here in America. And it was a big scandal. So this was a scandal that introduced the Murdochs to the world outside the 14th Circuit. Okay, so now everybody in the state knew the Murdoch name was not a good introduction. It was a very negative introduction to the world outside our five county area. So you've got the boat crash and now you've got the murders. And people are wondering, okay, were these murders retribution for the boat crash? Is Alex somehow involved in something shady? We were just kind of wondering and going in all different directions. At this time, we did not know any of the details behind the investigation until September. September of 2021, Labor Day weekend, Alex Murdoch calls 911 again to report that he had been shot. He reported that he had a flat tire, unidentified man stopped to help, and then pulled a gun and shot him in the head. Now this story, which went kind of national after the homicides, the murders, it kind of went international after that because Saturday, Labor Day weekend, Alex Murdoch reports being shot. And then uh, investigation proves that he's lying. There's a lot of things that don't add up. Then the next Monday, two days later, his law firm, the family law firm started by Alex's great grandfather in 1910, announces it is fast uh, Alex to resign under allegations of stolen money. And from there, it just kind of spirals one revelation after the next. Alex says he has a drug addiction. You know, SLED's now investigating the stolen money from the law firm. And from there, it becomes an international saga that, you know, makes its way to Netflix. 
It's just worldwide <laughs> now. And that's probably why a lot of your listeners in Australia first heard the name Murdoch was probably through the, the worldwide Netflix documentary that was produced not too long ago. You're very correct there because it's kind of a story that's it's very movie, it's very Hollywood, it's very Netflix. It, it has so many twists and turns. What were the allegations from his business from where he worked? What was he accused of doing and how much money was he accused of dealing with? At first, they didn't know how much money, but he was accused of stealing from clients, stealing from his own law partners and from clients. The law firm, which I imagine like most law firms, work under a system where all the money that comes in belongs to the firm. And then the firm divides it up amongst partners and associates, and they pay paralegals, and they have a certain formula of how everybody gets paid. And he was taking money off the top before it even got into the law firm's coffers. So right away, they discovered that he's stealing from the firm. And as the investigation continued, they realized that he was stealing from his clients as well. So while all this is happening, we're still in September, and a man named Curtis Edward Smith is arrested. Why? What was his involvement? Curtis Edward Smith was a friend and reportedly a relative of Alex, like a distant cousin to the Murdochs. And he was arrested and charged in connection with this roadside shooting. So Alex was telling everyone that this mystery man shot him. Well, when they arrested Curtis and the investigation continued, first Curtis was charged and then Alex Murdoch was charged. They called it an uh, insurance scam. The idea was that he knew that he was in trouble. The allegations about the stolen money were about to be made public. And he wanted basically an assisted suicide. He wanted somebody to help take him out so that his surviving son, Buster, which is Richard Alexander Murdoch Jr., could get like a $10 million life insurance policy. And so... That was Alex Murdoch's very first criminal charges. Then in November, the first of the financial crimes indictments started coming. One of the attorneys compared it to Alex Murdoch's version of Black Friday. In one of my articles, I compared it to waves on a low country beach. They just kept coming. One wave of indictments after the other kept coming until by early 2023, Alex Murdoch was facing more than 100 criminal charges just for the financial crimes. So was he behind bars by that November? When did he actually get arrested and put in jail? I don't have the dates in front of me, but Alex was arrested just a couple of days after Curtis Eddie Smith was in late September. So he checked himself into rehab. He received a $20,000 PR bond and his attorneys checked him into rehab. He announced that he had a drug addiction. That was why he stole all the money, or that was why he made bad decisions. He didn't steal the money right away. So he checks himself into rehab, and then in October, more criminal charges are filed, and when he returns to court, he is then incarcerated. So Alex Murdoch has been in some form of detainment since October of 2021. At first, it was county jails. And then it was a county jail in the state capital in Columbia. And he stayed in the state capital for quite some time until in July of 2022, he was charged with the murders of his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. And once convicted, he is now serving two life sentences in a state prison. How did it come to light that he was, one, a suspect, and then two, you know, the actual person that did it? Well, one of the newspapers around here published a couple of reports citing anonymous sources kind of early on in late 2021, early 2022. You know, some papers use anonymous sources more than others. Reports were basically that he was a person of interest, that state police were taking a good hard look at him. And we know most of what we know now by sitting through the murder trial. He was indicted for murder in, I think, July 14th, 2022. His attorneys asked for a speedy trial, and he got it. In January, late January 2023, he got a murder trial right here in the 14th Circuit in a town called Walterboro, which is in Colleton County, 
the same county where the murders happened. Now, during the trial, the trial lasted six weeks. I sat through that murder trial and covered almost every day of it for six weeks. And we know what we know now, primarily from listening to the evidence and the testimony in that trial. And I think I can walk you through this in a simplified way from the boat crash to now. And in, in just a couple of minutes, I think I can tell you based on the evidence and based on highly informed speculation, we, could, we now know what happened. And the boat crash was a catalyst for these murders. Please walk us through it. All right. So you've got a boat crash. And a young lady, a very popular, beautiful blonde co-ed is dead in a very public manner. Going missing in the water for a week is going to attract a lot of negative attention. Well, March, less than a month after the crash, a personal injury lawsuit is filed. And this attorney, Mark Tinsley, a judge later referred to him as a tiger. Alex Murdoch had a tiger on his tail. And Mark Tinsley was, you know, looking for at least a $10 million or more wrongful death settlement or suit. And as part of it, he was asking questions about Alex Murdoch's finances. He knew Alex had been settling a lot of cases. Alex should have had a lot of money. He should have been making millions of dollars a year. And he was asking some very hard questions and demanding that Alex turn over his financial records So they could, you know, if it goes to trial, they can actually determine what kind of damages he can pay. Alex Murdoch cannot turn over his financial records because he is living in a very shady house of cards. He is stealing money from clients. He's stealing money from the law firm. He's up to his eyeballs in debt. He's partnering with the local banker and they're stealing money at the bank and they're moving things around to cover their crimes and doing all kinds of shady financial things behind the scenes. And Alex can't turn over his finances because the law firm will see what he's doing. The law enforcement will see what he's doing. So this kind of comes to a head on the day of June 7th. Alex was accosted by their financial director, Jenny Seckinger, confronted Alex in the law firm building in Hampton and said, there's a $762,000 check that's missing. And We think you got it. Can you prove that you don't have this money or can you prove where it's at? He was confronted with something that he couldn't deal with in that moment. He needed some time to cover his tracks. And state prosecutors believe that he killed his own wife and son, number one, as a distraction to distract law enforcement and If you look at it one way, it seems like a rational plan. If you look at it another way, it seems totally illogical and irrational, but it briefly worked. It distracted everyone from looking at him as a suspect and uh, bought him time. But all this comes out in the murder trial. They were murdered. The world thinks that Alex is the victim of a vigilante. Alex is a personal injury lawyer, just like Mark Tinsley. He knows if a jury thinks he's a victim, they're not going to make him pay millions in damages or millions in settlements. If young Paul is murdered, the criminal case goes away. Maybe the civil case, the wrongful death suit goes away. And while everyone is feeling sorry for him, he's got condolences of the whole world, the law firm. Jenny Seckinger stopped asking questions. All of these internal questions at the law firm stopped. They all felt sorry for Alex. And behind the scenes, he was borrowing money from his banker friend to put back the $762,000 that he stole and doing other things to cover his tracks so that when they got back to looking at him, boom, there's the money. All the money's there. Everything's fine. Lawsuit goes away. That's why we think they were murdered. That's why state prosecutors think they were murdered. And that's why a jury of his peers decided he was guilty. I've written down two words while hearing you describe all of that, selfish and evil, (laughs) because I can't grapple with the fact that someone over financial crimes would revert to murdering their family. It took a lot for people to wrap their head around it. A word I've heard used a lot is, uh, is narcissist, psychopath or sociopath. He just by any means necessary to protect his family name, protect his lifestyle, cover up his crimes. 
at the time, no one knew. At the time of the murders, he, has, he had had no criminal charges. No one knew that he'd been stealing money for over a decade. At first, we thought it was like eight and a half million, but the most recent f figures are roughly $10 million he has stole from multiple victims in multiple South Carolina counties for over a decade. So he didn't have one skeleton in his closet. He had a whole damn skeleton full. And he was a personal injury lawyer. He knew how people perceived defendants. And this was a very desperate act. But it unraveled on him. The evidence unraveled on him. From the moment he called 911, number one, he started lying. The evidence didn't support what he was saying. From the moment he called 911, he started telling people about the boat crash. He didn't just call and say, hey, I found my wife and son shot to death and murdered at our home. He started saying, I think someone killed my son because of the boat crash. When the first mm -hmm. police officers arrived at the scene, he said, I think this is the work of, of vigilantes. I think my son was killed because of this boat crash back in 2019. He started painting this narrative and pushing this narrative that it was connected and that it was vigilantes. And we all see now, and we can get technical and go into all the many bits and pieces of evidence that didn't match up. And that's always fun now that the trial's over. But from the moment he dialed that telephone, it was all about, I think it's connected to the boat crash. And that was part of his evil plan. Did you hear from Alex during the trial? And has he shown any remorse for what he's done? Alex has shown remorse. Now, he's serving two life sentences in uh, state prison. And this is a very complicated case. This is like a hydra. Maybe an octopus might be a better word. There are so many <laughs> ongoing tentacles in this thing. There's a possible appeal in the murder case. There's a possible jury tampering allegation angle. But as far as the financial crimes, he has pled guilty in federal court. He hasn't been sentenced yet in federal court. He has pled guilty in state court and has been sentenced to 27 years in prison. In addition to the two life sentences, he has only expressed remorse for the financial stuff. He's apologized to his victims. He's apologized to his family and the law firm and the damage he's caused to their image. But to this day, he maintains that he is innocent of the murder. He admits he's a thief, he admits he's a liar, but he says he did not kill his wife and son. I want to pause for a second and bring up another tentacle that Alex is not necessarily involved in, but the death of Gloria Satterfield. She comes up in amongst all of this investigation and police start looking into that death as well as looking into the death of Stephen, which we brought up earlier. Can you talk us through Gloria? Who was she in relation to the Murdoch household? What happened to her? We still don't know that Stephen Smith is in any way connected to anyone with the name Murdoch. We don't know. And that's something we need to make clear. It's an unsolved case. No one's been, been charged in his homicide. Gloria Satterfield was a household employee for Alex and Maggie Murdoch. Her family doesn't like it that the, the media has referred to her over and over again as Alex Murdoch's housekeeper. She was more than that. She was a longtime uh, household employee. Some say she was even a nanny to their children and did a lot of things for the family, and she worked for him for a long time. Well, she fell in February of 2018, I believe it is. So check my dates behind me. There are so many dates in this Murdoch timeline. In February of 2018, Gloria fell at the Moselle household, the Moselle estate, a big 1,700-acre estate in, in Hampton and Colleton County, where the murders happened, by the way. So she fell down the steps and struck her head, and eventually died from her injuries or complications of her injuries about two weeks later. There's always rumors. So now once all this thing comes out about the Murdochs and the boat crash, and then, of course, the murders, I've seen writers describe it like this. Now you've got a trail of bodies all connected to the Murdochs. We don't know if Stephen Smith's connected or not, but it just sounds we've got two murdered people, Stephen Smith, Gloria Satterfield. So now if you want to get colorful with it, you could say we have a trail of unsolved deaths or a trail of bodies connected to his family. But Gloria fell. And what we believe happened is Alex Murdoch sprang into action. There's always rumors that there's some foul play, that somebody pushed her down the stairs. But there's no evidence of that. And her own family doesn't believe that. 
Alex sprang into action and told her sons, her children, hey, I'm going to help you guys out. Why don't you sue my insurance and I will help you get a settlement? Okay. He got another lawyer involved, one of his buddies, old college law school roommate and Paul Murdoch's godfather, Corey Fleming. He said, why don't you use this guy? This guy is a great lawyer. He's a buddy of mine. He will help you sue my insurance and I'll get you some money. And they did. Corey sued Alex's insurance. Alex kind of bullied the insurance company into settling. And we're talking about a major insurance company, Lloyd's of London. And all, I think, $4.3 million was paid out. But the family of Gloria Satterfield got nothing, not one penny. It all went to Alex Murdoch. And, of course, Corey Fleming got a little cut. And so the boys just kind of forgot about it. They just said, well, if Alex Murdoch, this well-known lawyer, if he can't get us any money, then nobody can. But they just kind of forgot about it. And it was all part of the state's criminal investigation. And the first financial charges levied against Alex were related to that scam for Gloria Satterfield. After that, they were all connected to the law firm, connected to stealing from clients. But those charges in Gloria's case were the first state grand jury charges against him. Alex still has a living son, Buster, who we've mentioned a few times. Do we know how he has reacted, how he feels watching all of this happen? He's watched his dad being charged with an obscene amount of charges. He's lost his mum. He's lost his brother. Have we heard from him? I can't imagine what that young man's going through. He has truly lost everyone in his family. Even though his father's still alive, he's never going to be a free man again. He's a very disgraced man. And I sat beside Buster kind of across the alleyway in the courtroom for six weeks. I watched this young man. I saw a torrent of emotions come on his face. One minute it would be anger. The next minute he's crying. It was hard to read him in the courtroom when all this testimony was going on as far as if he believed his father was guilty or how he felt. He never addressed the public, never made a statement. Then after his father was convicted, he released a statement. One statement said that he had absolutely nothing to do with Stephen Smith's death and that he wished people would stop spreading rumors and leave him alone. And he actually appeared on a documentary here in, on uh, Fox Nation where he spoke out at great length. And in the documentary, he says, I know my father's a thief and a liar and a, and a manipulator, but I don't think he's capable of murder. So his only public statement on the matter of the murders was in that Fox Nation interview. And he, just like Alex is denying that he had anything to do with the murders, Buster refuses to believe, at least publicly, he refuses to believe that his loving father, the man he has known his whole life, he just does not believe he, he committed those crimes. You've told us that you've sat through six weeks of a trial. You've also written books on this. How has this case affected you? I am the only journalist, and this is not a boastful thing, this is not an ego thing, this is a factual thing. I'm the only journalist that knew these people before all of this happened. I'm the only journalist that lives in this town where it all happened. Hampton County is a small county here in the low country. And the law firm is located in our county seat in Hampton. The bank that Alex Murdoch partnered with the former banker to, to steal all this money, Russell Lafitte. He's also convicted and serving time in federal court now. So all of these things are right here in Hampton County, literally 15 minutes from my home. I live in the southern part of the county. I drive by that law firm every day. I do business at that bank. I went to school with Alex Murdoch's younger brother. Alex Murdoch's mother, Libby, was my English teacher in middle school. So I, I am of the hundreds of people writing about this, this family and this case in the third person, in a sense. I'm writing about this in the first person kind of viewpoint. This is my home, my community. These people were my elected officials. And so it's absolutely, from that point of view, I can't go anywhere without being reminded of, of this this story, this very tragic story. You know, it's affected every part of my life. Some people in town who had deep love for the Murdochs no longer speak to me. When they do, it's not as warm and friendly as it was because I have written about this whole tragic thing from beginning to end. 
it's kind of consumed my whole life. My wife has told me if she hears the name Murdoch one more time, if she has to sit through one more Murdoch TV show, that she's going to divorce me. And it's just crazy stuff. My kids come home from school and say, Dad, people were talking about the Murdoch thing at school. And it's just consumed our lives. And quite frankly, I mean, it's a tragic story. I won journalism awards telling it, but I will be so glad when it's over, when I can write about someone other than Alex Murdoch. When will that be? I think it'll be quite some time to come. Lastly, I just want to ask you more about the moral questions that arise from this story. How do we grapple with what this teaches us about power and influence and the way justice works? I know that's a big question, but I feel like this story or what has happened with this family kind of throws that up in the air and makes you really question it. It does. When this story first got big, while every journalist is trying to get the next scoop and find out what's going to happen next. I was pretty much the only journalist to take a look back into the history of this family because we've always known that the Murdochs were shady. My grandfather used to tell me, I come from a family with a colorful past. Uh, Some of them used to make moonshine back in the old days. And my grandfather would tell my dad and my dad would tell me that if you wanted to make moonshine back in the day, you had to bribe Buster Murdoch and then you could get away with it. So I kind of took a deep dive into the family history And Alex's grandfather was accused of being in a great moonshine conspiracy. He was accused of the same thing that Alex was convicted of, stealing from clients. He was accused of tax evasion, which Alex Murdoch was convicted of. The only difference is he managed to get away and use his power and influence and get off the hook. So there's a big system wide around here. We use the term the good old boy system. It kind of shines a very harsh spotlight on how powerful, well-connected people can commit crimes, get away with crimes, and work the system in their favor. And that is a good thing. We're now seeing some reform, or at least the very beginnings of reform. The lawmakers are taking a look at how probate cases are handled. So when there's a wrongful death suit, where that money goes, they're taking a look at certain judges All of our legal system now is kind of under a spotlight here. And from a moral standpoint, this whole thing is a step back from the system level of corruption and, and the good old boy system down to a more personal family level. This is kind of a life lesson from the boat crash to now. We don't want to sound like we're victim shaming or anything, but if there was ever a lesson about the perils of underage drinking and drinking and driving, that boat crash is it. I don't think I was the only father that sat down and talked to my kids and my family after that and said, hey, this is a reminder of what can happen on a careless night that can change your life and ruin your life. There are parables here, you know, from thou shalt not steal to bloodshed and murder. And it's all something we can learn from, whether it be on a personal family level or as a criminal justice system. There are lessons to be learned here. And I think that they are very hard lessons, but they're being learned. Thanks to Michael for assisting us to tell this story. Michael is the editor and publisher of the Hampton County Guardian and author of several books, including a few on the Murdoch family. We've linked his most recent work, Fall of the House of Murdoch, in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you've enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a rating or review in your podcast app. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.